Good morning, Convergence Church. How's everyone doing? So glad you're here. Um, thank you for being here this morning. I'm looking forward to worshiping together. A little, little chilly outside. Feels like winter, which is good. It should feel like winter during winter time. Unless oh, I'm getting head nods. No. So, okay. My wife probably agrees. She doesn't like the winter either. Um, that was one thing when we lived in Houston, you didn't have to worry about. They don't have winter there. It's just summer and nighttime. And they're the same temperature. Just one's dark. It's basically it. But, uh, yeah, we're so glad you're here this morning. If everyone will stand with us, um, we're going to worship the Lord together. I'm going to read our call to worship. It's from Psalm 134. David writes this. Come, bless the Lord, are you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Let's sing together. sing. Come 
voice as I sing holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Yes, that's right. Sing it out. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I <laughs> How good is God? Man, he is awesome. Yeah. And it, and this is the moment when we all come together and we're worshiping. And we 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 sing this song of adoration, this 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 uh acknowledgement of God's greatness and and it does something to us. One it it, it puts us in a a uh a moment of awe and wonder at how great God is, but then it also reveals something true about ourselves. And we, and we understand that our, our desire to be in relationship with our creator is something that runs to the, the core of every one of us, like the, the depths of our soul. That's what we desire. And, and, and what we realize is that to be in a relationship with our creator, he said, this is what you need to do. Just be perfect and holy like I am. And when we encounter God's greatness, when we encounter who he is, it, we see just how far short of that we come. And, and so we're, we're faced with a problem, right? That, that our deepest desire is to be in a relationship with him, and yet we're impo it's impossible for us to do it, especially on our own. We can't make ourselves perfect and holy, and so we need help. But praise God, he has told us how we can find that help, and, and it starts with confession. So we always want to come together in this moment. And we just want to come before the Father, and we just want to confess as a family. Those things that every day um, we hold on to that separate us from him. These sins, we want to lay them at his feet. So if you'll join me in a moment of prayer, we're just going to corporately together confess to the Lord. Abba, Father, Lord, we uh, come to you in this moment. Uh, God, we, as we sing that song, it's just, in some ways, breathtaking to understand how great you are. And singing those words uh, in our hearts, it, it, it just moves them to want to be near you. God, somebody so great and so wonderful, we, we desire to be near you, and yet we realize there are things that we cling on to that inhibit our ability to draw near. But God, thank you that you told us that if we'll confess our sins to you, you are faithful and just to forgive them. God, so we just come before you right now, and we just want to lay these at your feet, God. We want to enter into a moment of just confessing to you in our hearts, God, the things that we allow in our life to, to keep us from drawing near you. Father, we just we confess those to you, and we pray that you would forgive us for those. But God, as we are in this Advent season, God, we were reminded, we were reminded that you didn't leave us on our own. God, that you came to us. God, you came to us so that there would be a way we could be reconciled to you. God, that we could be, we could find our way back into that relationship that we desire the most with you, God. And we're grateful and, and God, we thank you. Not only do you forgive us, but you've made a way for us to be near you. And it's through your son, Jesus Christ, who you sent on our behalf, who came and lived the perfect life, that, that perfect and holy life we was required. But ultimately, he did that so he could give it, so he could sacrifice it on a cross. And then you tell us that if we'll put our faith in what you've already done on the cross, Father, that in that moment, he took on our sin on the cross. So that the punishment, the, the wages of sin, your, your word tells us, the wages of sin is death. The punishment that was due for those sins of all the world were put on him. 
so that your perfect justice could be satisfied. But at the same moment, when we put our faith in what you've done, that he exchanged his righteousness so that we might become, as you say, the righteousness of him. That through our faith in Christ, we are now made uh, whole again. We are made new. We are uh, instantly made right with you. And that we can rejoice in that. And so as we continue singing this morning, God, as we sing this song, I pray that it would just be a moment we're reminded of how faithful you are to, to not only promise, but deliver. God, we love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone in here has something in common with Jesus. We were all born, right? 
Jesus came in humanity in the form of a baby. Could have chosen any way possible because he's God. He can do whatever he pleases. But he came in the form of human and he dwelt amongst us. And he, his birth fulfilled thousands of years of prophecy about a coming king that would come to rescue his people. As we, we move into this Advent season, week number two, the people of Israel prior to Jesus would have been longing and expecting this king. I think as Christians, we look at our scripture, the Old and New Testament, and we see the stories of God, particularly in the New Testament, the life of Jesus. It's easy for us to look back at what Jesus has done because he's great, amen? But how many of y'all know that Jesus is coming back? He's coming back to judge the world and bring righteousness, righteousness to every, everything and everyone. He's coming back to judge the world. And that's something that, that Christians, and t- typically myself and other people I speak with, that's not something we talk about very much. There's a, there's a word, Maranatha, which means Lord, come quickly. Anytime, you know, we see the world in panic, you'll, you'll see people post it on Facebook. Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. But the reality is, as Christians, even on our best day, we should still be asking for the Lord to come quickly. Because at Jesus' return will just blow everything we've experienced in this world out of the water in great ways. And so the Advent season for us is a time to prepare our hearts, one, to look back on what God has done, but also to look forward to the coming King's return. Amen? And so we're going to pray. You guys can sit where you're at. We did this last week. We're going to do a corporate prayer. And I'm just going to ask you guys to pray with me. This is just a prayer to kind of get our hearts tuned for Advent. Pray with me. Merciful God, always with us, always coming. We confess we do not know how to prepare for your advent. We have forgotten how to hope in miracles. We've ignored the promise of your kingdom. We get distracted by all the busyness of this season. Forgive us, God. Grant us the simple wonder of the shepherds, the intelligent courage of the magi, and the patient faith of Mary and Joseph that we may journey with them to Bethlehem and find the good news of a child born for us. Now, in the quiet of our hearts, we ask you to make us ready for his coming. Amen. Pastor Scott from Harvest, we've asked him to come and lead us this week in talking about encountering the peace of Jesus. Let's give it up for Scott. If you have your Bibles, turn the two, uh, turn in them or power them on. And if you got the uh, the U version, I guess Bible app, hit Luke chapter two, and we're going to be reading from verses eight to twenty. Verses eight to twenty. Luke, the author, writes, but God, the Holy Spirit, says. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Verse 9, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David. A Savior, who is the Christ, the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Verse 13, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, verse 14, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see for ourselves this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Verse 17, and when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child. 
And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up these things, pondering them in her heart. Verse 20, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your word. We need it. I need it. Thank you for this season where we look back and remember the great one. And we look ahead and remember his coming. Lord, I pray that the presence of heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, would illumine the scriptures to our hearts so that we might rejoice in you. And we might rejoice in the Savior. And we might be filled and controlled by the Spirit. Lord, help us now. I pray that the word of God would lead us to you, the God of the word. And it's in Jesus' name we all pray and all God's people said, amen. It was a rather quiet and, and really an ordinary event. According to human standards, definitely not the type of event that a royal was fit for. It was simple. It was quiet. It was pretty much unattended. You know the story in Luke chapter 2 verses 1 through 7. There was an edict that was sent out by Caesar Augustus. Which caused a young man and a young woman to, to pick up in her, ladies, her third trimester. <laughs> Y'all know what that's like? Her third trimester to pick up and to travel 70 miles to Joseph's hometown of Bethlehem so that he could pay taxes. Well, upon arrival, it was time for the baby to come and there was no place for them to stay. And therefore, there was no place that was probably of sorts to have a baby. And part of the reason was Caesar Augustus, he decreed an edict and it's caused all, the, all types of people to come back home to their hometown and, and register and to pay taxes. So there was nowhere, nowhere for them to stay. And so the parents, what they do, they, they do like most of us as parents. And we can all admit that none of us know what we're doing when we have children. <laughs> they say you're ready to parent when the kids leave. And I, I wonder if that's true. So the parents, they made the best arrangements that they could. They found a cave, perhaps a, stave, a stable behind this inn where the animals were kept. And there in the cave and in the stable, the greatest miracle in the history of the world took place. There the greatest of kings, the greatest of prophets, the greatest of priests, the greatest of humans, there, God, very God, took on flesh. God incarnate was born into the world he created. The greatest miracle known to man. Last week, Pastor Brian opened our Advent series when he preached on Luke 1 about, about the hope of Jesus. And so this week, we're going to be looking at Luke 2, 8 through 20. And we're going, to be, we're going to be talking about what this Jesus brings. And one of the things that we'll talk about is he brings peace because he is the Prince of Peace. And so I'm entitling this sermon, The Greatest Announcement of All Time. But before I do and before I, I go into the, the passage, there's two things that you have to know contextually that will really add to the color of what we're talking about today. I have to admit that as I've studied and looked at this thing, it, it's really helped open my heart to this season because like many of us, we're, I mean, with COVID going on and the holidays, it's, it's easy to be distracted. But there's two things you got to know. The first, or at least I want to remind us about, the author Luke here in our passage who is writing, who's writing, or whose writing we're reading, he's an investigator. He's, he's an investigator, and what he's doing in the book of Luke is he's, he's sharing his findings with us. 
And these findings which were written for a prominent man by the name of Theophilus are historical fact. Let me say that again. What we just read is historical fact. He, what, what Luke did, he, he interviewed eyewitnesses and he gathered his research. And who did he interview according to Luke chapter 1? He interviewed the apostles. He interviewed other ministers of the word. And he took his information and he put it down for this prominent man named Theophilus. And so this historical narrative that we're reading about isn't a, a dramatization. It isn't some fictional fantasy. It isn't some cute children's story. These events really happened. I can't say that enough. We're not just reading just any old stuff. We're reading what really happened. So that's the first. The second thing that will add context for us or help us understand is that the Holy Spirit through Luke was intentionally painting a paradox in the Christmas story. He was painting a contrast. He was coloring in like pink and yellow and neon green the irony or the enigma of what God values and what we value. He was doing something that was over our head. For example, as you know, royal babies are given special treatment. They're, they're born in the best hospitals. They're born with the best doctors. Uh, they're born with crowds awaiting the announcement of the baby's birth and the gender and the name. As you guys recall, in 2015, this lovely couple, Prince William and Kate... They announced to the world their beautiful baby, Charlotte, in 2015, May 2015. And listen to the official statement it read that day. It stated this, The Duke and the Duchess of Cambridge are delighted to announce that they've named their daughter Charlotte Elizabeth Diana. And the world was like, yeah! Especially if you know who Diana was. Remember Diana? Remember the one who was in a car wreck? So... So when they announced it that day, I mean, the crowds roared. The announcement also said, the baby will be known as her Royal Highness Princess Charlotte of Cambridge. And that day, if you recall, every media outlet in the world covered the whole story. I mean, we were just glued, whether it be to the internet or to the paper, if we read it that morning. But in the story that came in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7... No one really was there waiting. Not this baby, not this king. He was born in a place of obscurity. Bethlehem, there's nothing in Bethlehem. Born in a place of obscurity. His birth took place in a cave. He was laid in a feeding trough. Perhaps given his stature, the natural mind of the day would have Probably thought, hey, what if probably Israel's leaders and religious elites should have known about this and should have been there at that moment. But they weren't. King Herod wasn't there. The Sanhedrin wasn't there. Pharisees weren't there. The scribes were there. No one was really there. This baby did not get the special treatment. And that's what Luke was highlighting. We got to remember that as we read this story. Let me give you one quick more, one more quick example. You know, the birth of Jesus, according to the first seven verses of chapter two and look, did you know, and we all know this, but I'm just saying this to myself. Do I know, do we know that it was, he was, his birth took place under the reign of Caesar Augustus, formerly known as Octavian, Octavian the Great. He was and you guys who know, who know history, he was Rome's first and greatest emperor. His name means majestic and lofty and venerable, and he's known as the increaser. He was responsible for Rome's transformation from a republic 
to an empire. His reign lasted 40 years and he doubled the size of the empire. What he did, and he was pretty bright, he was brilliant. He, he combined military might and institution building, at which, which really laid the foundation of 200 years of Roman peace. Caesar Augustus was great. Augustus was par excellence. He was God to the Roman Empire. He was God to the world. Everywhere you went and you saw Caesar, I mean, you saw his bust. You saw a statue of Augustus the Great. And Luke, in chapter 2, verse 1, knew what he was doing when he said, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. What was he doing? He was pointing to the paradox. He was painting a contrast. He was coloring in pink and neon yellow and neon green. The irony and the enigma that in the backdrop of the greatest emperor of all time, here he comes, the king of kings and the lord of lords, right in humanity's greatest emperor's backyard. In his own empire, the king of kings comes. The greatest miracle in the, on, the, on, the, on the history of the planet took place. And it was the birth of Christ. So low context. I apologize for getting excited. Bear with me. Well, how should we respond? Really, when you look at the first seven verses of chapter 2, it was just all about this birth. Now as we look at verses 8 through 20, how should we respond this Advent? How should we respond to the greatest announcement of all time? Well, first notice one. In verses 8 through 14, notice first that the angels must worship. Verse 8 tells us that there were shepherds in a field watching over their flock. Verse 9, God sent this angel. And having known the story, as all of, we know, as all of, we, as all of us know, this was the third appear, appearance of an angel making an announcement in these early chapters. The first appearance was to Zechariah. The second was to Mary. And now here appears this angel to these shepherds. Perhaps it was Gabriel. The text doesn't say specifically. Um, he, he had come twice, so maybe it was him, but it doesn't say. And what about angels? Well, as you know, angels, according to Hebrew, Hebrews 1.14, they are ministering spirits sent out by God to serve those who would inherit salvation. They were servants of the Most High God. They were servants of Yahweh. And they were made higher than the humans, than us. You know, humans are made a little lower than the angels. So who were angels? They were ministers of God. They, were, they, were, they had a, a position of a little higher than us as humans. And notice the uniqueness of this angel. He shows up and it's interesting. He shows up and it says that he shows up and with him is the glory of the Lord. It says it said the glory of the Lord shone around him. It surrounds him. What, what's this glory of the Lord? This glory of the Lord that shows up with this angel is the bright light that surrounds the presence of God himself. Sometimes it appears in a cloud as seen in Exodus. Sometimes it, it appears as a burning fire as you see in Revelation or in Ezekiel. Here, the glory of the Lord shows up. And this visitation from the angel and the glory of the Lord, it strikes fear in these shepherds, as it should. It would strike fear in every one of us, as it should. And now notice the announcement. In verses 10 and 11 from the angel, which I, which I believe is the heart of the, the passage here. This angel, this ministering spirit from God comes and makes an announcement. And it reads, the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people, for unto you this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. 
What was the announcement? Listen to what the announcement was. It was good news that on that specific day in the city of David, as was prophesied, a Savior who is Christ, the Lord, was born. The angel was announcing to these shepherds the greatest news. If you were Jewish, this was the greatest news that you would ever hear. Because on that day, the Savior, the Christ, God, very God, took on flesh and was born. And as many of you know, there are 44 Old Testament prophecies about this Jewish Messiah. For example, he would be born of a woman according to Genesis 3.15. He'd be born in Bethlehem according to Micah 5.2. He'd be born of a virgin and called Emmanuel, God with us according to Isaiah 7.14. He would come from the tribe of Judah, according to Genesis 49.10. He'd be in the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, according to Genesis 12 through 24. He'd be called king, according to Psalm 2 and Zechariah 9. And I could go on and on and on, but you get the point. As a whole, the Jewish people knew of this coming anointed one. And also, I want you to notice one more thing in verse 11 where it says of who this king is. He is a savior, he is Christ, and he is Lord. Do know, and I, I got humbled. <laughs> My grits were handed to me again as I was studying this. These are three titles. Later, after this passage, literally just a few verses later, remember Joseph and Mary gave him the name Jesus. Jesus means Yahweh saves or Joshua saves. The Lord saves. But that's not, that's a name. That's not a title. The angel says it's a savior who is Christ the Lord. He gives three titles here. And just listen, he's first the Savior. The Savior is a title. It's found four times in the New Testament, twice in Luke and twice in Acts. He's the one who will save his people from their sins. He's the Savior. He will save them from the wrath of his Father because of their sins. He will, in essence, save them from the penalty and the punishment for their rebellion against God. He is the Savior. So when we sing Savior, Christ the Savior is born. That's a title. And notice not only is he Savior, but he's also the Christ. This is Greek. This title in Hebrew means Messiah or the anointed one. In the Old Testament, it's, it's Messiah. In the New Testament, it, it, it's Greek. It's two different names, but it has the same meaning. It's this one who who is this messianic ruler that they had been waiting for. He's the Messiah. Then thirdly, he's Lord, implying that he is God. Actually, he is Yahweh. And if you're Jewish and you're, you're listening to this, this is really wrecking shop for us. He, he's, he's Yahweh. He's, he's the one. And then the, the, the angel said, this one is the Lord. This one is the one who revealed himself to Moses in a burning bush. Remember when Moses said, uh, who is it? Who is it that I say to, to the leaders of, of, of Israel that sent me? Who, who do I say to them? And God said, tell them that I am is the one that sent you. That's who this is. The tetragrammaton, the one who has always existed, has sent you. And I know we know this, but, but, but Jesus was the agent of creation. He was the Father's agent in creation. I think of Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For by him did all things exist. He created every, everything in heaven and earth for himself. This is the one. This is the Lord. And so after this great announcement, what do the angels do? They worship God. They praise God saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom God is pleased. 
And then all of a sudden, and I, I can't explain this one. I was reading it and reading it and reading it. But there's something that happens in the story where you just go, whoa. This angel and the glory of the Lord shines around him. And then all of a sudden, there's a multitude of angels. I mean, thousands upon thousands of angels just immediately show up. And they start singing this song. It's like, whoa. Angels were just mysterious, unique creatures that God created him for himself. And then if you're one of the shepherds, you're just like going, whoa. And then all of a sudden, there's just thousands upon thousands of them. And you're just like, whoa. I mean, I don't know. How, do we, how, do we, how would we respond to that? But it's true. It's facts. I don't care what anybody says. The Bible is not just some made up stories. This is facts. This happened. And I wish God would show up to, to some degree. I know we walk by faith and not by sight. But what if, you know, actually Hebrews says that we've, we've entertained angels unannounced. But what if thousands upon thousands, we would trip out. I would trip out. So the angels must worship and I'm going to hurry. How else? Should creation worship the lowly? Number two, the lowly must see in worship. The lowly must see. The announcements to the shepherds, they, they highlight the great reversal that has begun to take place in the world. For those of you who are, who are, who are studiers of Luke or who know the book of Luke, Luke emphasized to us that God has now come to the outcast and he now welcomes the lowly he now welcomes them and he chooses to reveal himself to shepherds and as you know shepherds were on the very bottom of the social scale many were charlatans they were liars they were swindlers in those days you couldn't trust their word their testimony was often discredited in the jewish court of law and they slept in fields and they smelt like animals they were dirty and they were unkept. They were unclean because oftentimes uh, a shepherd in a field, if, if, uh, if, if one of their lambs died, they had to do something with it. So they touched dead animals. And as you would suspect, shepherds would have never been on the very VIP list of a royal. No way. To say it nicely, they were, they were lowly. But again, remember the paradox or the contrast that, that God through Luke is writing and painting. And remember the sign that the angel in verse 12 told the shepherds. He says, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. No royal baby would ever be caught sleeping, especially his first day on this earth in a feeding trough. No way. We wouldn't do that with our own kids. You see, God's ways are different than our ways. God's ways can't be traced. God doesn't value what we value. God is different. That's what makes him holy. And so this amazing appearance of the glory of God and the thousands upon thousands of angels praising God and proclaiming the birth of it, it moves the shepherds to do something, to act. And so the shepherds say to one another in verses 15 and 16, they say, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing which the Lord, the Lord has shown to us. This was God's doing. God, this was God's idea. God was showing some things to these lowly people. He was making a point to say, no, 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 this is me doing it. I'm not going to send my butler. I'm not going to send my driver. I'm going to do it myself. So the lowly acted in verse 17 and 18 he'd say that, that they saw the baby wrapped lying in a manger and they, they told Mary and they told Joseph what the angel had told them. And then after hearing what went down, Mary and Joseph and, and anyone else that was there, they, they, they were in wonder about what the shepherds, I mean, they were just like, whoa. 
And then it says Mary treasured these things in her heart and she pondered them. A mom knows. And I just want to say this. I, I, this isn't in the notes. And it, this isn't the Lord. Just ignore it. But, but moms, especially moms here who walk with Jesus and you're, you're fighting and you're praying for the souls of your children. Those things that God ministers to you about your children, especially as they get older. Hold on to those. Walk with Jesus. As God makes you promises. Hold God to it. Mary pondered these things in her heart. Remember the angel first. Actually, it was the second uh, visit. He comes to her, though, in a personal way. Moms, you, you know your children and you know God. Well, the lowly saw for themselves their salvation. They saw. They saw with their eyes the Savior. They saw with their eyes the Christ. They saw with their eyes God, very God, in the human, in human form. And then they returned home, and like the angels, they were, they were glorifying and praising God. In essence, the shepherds worshipped. Well, how should, we, how should creation respond to the greatest announcement of all time? Angels must worship, the lowly must worship, and finally, my last point, we, we must worship. We must worship. Number three, let me show you briefly where I get this from. We must worship. Remember the paradox, there's a contrast going on in the story. Remember the great reversal has begun Luke, the writer, emphasizes that God not only welcomes shepherds and the lowly, but he also now welcomes Gentiles. He welcomes not only Jews, but also everyone who's not Jewish. Verse 10, it says the angels state, as they're singing, I bring you good news of great joy, and listen to what it says, for all peoples. The good news of Jesus' birth is for all people. It's for all ethnic groups. It's not just for the inner circle of the Jewish folk anymore. We're talking God here. We're talking like the Christ. We're talking uh, the Savior. And he's come down to say, no, 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 no. It's not just for the select few anymore. I'm going to do something different. It's for all people. But notice also verse 14, the angelic host, they praise and they sing. And listen to what they sing. They sing glory. I mean, we're talking thousands upon it. I mean, think of how, how, how we would be undone to hear thousands upon thousands of angels singing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among whom he is pleased. The peace here is the peace that God gives through the salvation of Jesus. As mentioned earlier, last week our Advent theme was encountering the hope of Jesus. We'll hear this week, our angels are singing for us, encounter the peace of Jesus. It's yours. Encounter it, the peace of Jesus. We're all we're all very familiar with the famous verse in Isaiah 9, 6 that says, For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and here it is, the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Jesus gives hope. Jesus is hope. Jesus gives peace. Jesus is peace. Do you need hope today? The answer is in a person. Do you need peace today? The answer is in a person. And his name is Jesus. And his titles are the Christ, the Savior, and God. Well, finally, to say that God was pleased or that God favored someone was a Jewish way of saying that they were one of God's chosen people. That's what the angels talked about here. They, 
They said, glory to God on earth, peace among those whom he is pleased. This means that God's gift of peace will not come to all humanity, but to those whom God is pleased to call to himself and to reveal to them. Think of the paradox. Who missed it? Herod missed it. Who missed it? Caesar missed it. Who missed it? The Sanhedrin missed it. Who missed it? The scribes missed it. Who missed it? The Pharisees missed it. Who got it? The lowly. And so if you're in here today and you don't know this person of Jesus, I don't know how else to say to you that he has come for you. If you're a a child in here, listen, it's not, it's not hard. God created you, but you were born a sinner because our first parents, Adam and Eve, rebelled against our maker, God. But God did not want that to stay. He wanted to, he wanted to reconcile. He wanted to, he wanted, as, as one, one child said at one time, he, he, God wanted uh, him and people to be friends again. God, God wanted to reconcile you to himself. And so how did he do it? He had to send the Prince of Peace to die in your place and for your sin so that you could be reconciled to God, so that you could be justified before his very own eyes. Today, will you, will you, will you come to the Prince of Peace? Will you come? the Prince of Peace. So this Advent season and every season convergence, we must worship. And and let's do it unashamedly. I I, I think I worship unashamedly. I I kind of like don't really care what people think about me when I'm really seeing who Jesus is. I mean, think about that for a moment. I'm all nervous when I'm out in public and what are people going to say and what are going to people think, but when I'm just kind of gazing at the face of Jesus... It just doesn't matter anymore because I'm seeing him for who he is. So in summary, if I could wrap this up in in one sentence, how should creation respond to the greatest announcement of all time? What must we do? We must worship. We must worship every angel, all the lowly, and you and I. So to close this time, We've asked Emmeline to come and sing a song that I think is appropriate for the occasion. And we pray that as she sings and perhaps we sing, let's leverage ourselves, let's lean in, and let's worship this Jesus who is the Prince of Peace. Afterwards, we'll have a few discussions if we have time. Emmeline, we're ready to worship. (laughs) Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining. Till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn.
taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break for the slave is our brother and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we let all within us praise his holy name Christ is the Lord oh praise his name forever his power and glory just talk for just a few moments will you talk to us in Jesus name amen if you would uh, gather with somebody near you there's some questions on your outline and they'll be up here Uh, well actually look at your outline we pass some outlines out all three questions we're just going to give a couple minutes for us to talk amongst ourselves and then from there we're going to transition all right if you would just break up
Hello, hello. All right, thank, thank you, Brother you. Scott, for that uh, message from the Word this morning. Um, I know we had a good discussion in our group. I trust all of you did, and I hope that uh, it will be the beginning of many more discussions throughout the day and even throughout the week as you take these lessons that we've been challenged with, reminded of, um, and uh, take them to take root in our own hearts in a new way, but take them out into those around us and proclaim this good news to them as well. Amen. Let's pray over this passage this morning, of this message that we've heard this morning. God in heaven, God, we just come before you with our hearts reminded of your glory, your majesty, your love for us, that you would condescend to come into your creation lowliest of circumstances, Father. You did it for your love for us. What a Savior. God, we love you. May that love shine forth in our hearts to those around us, to our families, to our friends, those we come into contact with. Lord, may that be the overriding message of our life, Lord. Your gospel, your good news. That on that day, the city of Bethlehem was born our Savior, Christ, our Lord. We love you. We thank you for this message this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to move into the time now of response. And as always, our response is centered around the Lord's Supper. And uh, you'll find in the back of the pew in front of you a little prepared cup. And... <clears throat> I love this time because as we've heard the message this morning of what happened, the events surrounding that, we now turn our hearts to why it happened. Why did Jesus do that? Why did he come? He was born to die. He came here, he took on flesh so that he might pay the price that we all deserved. He would shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. If that's your story this morning, then I invite you to take this cup and this bread in a moment, and let's proclaim that together by reminding ourselves of the sacrifice that he made. That was why he came. That's why he came. So let's, let's do that together. Let's proclaim that together. It's a moment we're going to come to this table and partake. But before we do that, we always want to have a time to examine ourselves, and as we've reflected are we living in the light of that? Do we have peace with God? Have we allowed the distractions of the world to drift our fo pull our focus away from Him? If so, and if we're not coming to the table in faith and trusting in Him, then I encourage you to come to the altar this morning. Confess those things. Confess what sin may be cropping up in your life. I'll be down here. Pastor Jonathan will be down here. And if you'd like one of us to pray with you, I mean, we can't absolve of your sin, but the Bible says we confess our sins to one another. And there is power in that. And there'll be an opportunity during this song to come forward. If there's a sin you need to confess to a brother or sister here, walk across the aisle, walk across the church, and take that person socially distanced <laughs> and confess that to them. Maybe it's somebody in your own family. Maybe you sinned against someone even this morning. Let's purify our hearts before the Lord this morning. Finally, if you're here this morning and, and you're not a follower of Jesus, I'd ask you not to take the bread and the juice and that cup. I have a different invitation for you. This morning, would you come to Jesus? We've heard a clear presentation of his advent on the earth. When he came as a little baby, my friend, he, he didn't stay a little baby. He grew up and he died, shed his blood for our sins, but then he rose again. The Bible tells us that he is coming again. And it won't be as a little baby the next time. It will be as the ruler supreme. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Don't wait till that day. You can do that today. So my invitation, if you're not a believer, if you're not a follower of Jesus, during this time, come and talk to one of us. We would love to take the Bible and show you what it means to follow Jesus. Right now, we're going to sing a song. As they sing through the first verse, I invite you just to reflect on these things, examine your heart. If you want to come forward and pray with one of us, that's the time to do that.
then after that second verse, we'll all stand together and continue to sing how sweet it is to trust in Jesus. Justin, lead us.
and he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Pray with me. Jesus, we love you. It is sweet to trust in you. Help us to do that in a very real way, daily, minute by minute. Not just on Sundays or when we're reminded of these things, but Lord, may we walk in that truth and realization of the sacrifice you gave for us, of your love for us, even on our worst days, Father. May that draw us to you. May that constrain us to live for you and to proclaim this truth to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated.